All right. Good evening, and uh, welcome to yet another uh, VZIC session. It's quite a full room today, so we're going to have quite a lot of attendees today. Of course, we can't sit together yet, so that will come hopefully soon enough. But today we have another very interesting session by uh, Peter Nijs, uh, really a language thing, so non nullable reference types. And uh, before we get started, uh, a small uh, introduction. Uh, so our next event is uh, already um, known, it's not online yet, so uh, we'll put it online very soon. Uh, it's going to be on June the 3rd, uh, which uh, is gonna, it's going to be a session by uh, Don Bibier. Uh, and he's going to do basically two sessions. Uh, it's going to do an intro to Code Rush as well as a uh, session uh, on deep dive dependency injection in .NET Core. So that will take place on June the 3rd. We are also still looking for speakers. Uh, there's still uh, quite a few sessions that we will do this year. And so we're always looking for interesting sessions um, like the one from today. And you can do that. You can uh, register uh, to become a speaker at FISIC. We welcome new talent as well, definitely. Uh, and uh, so just go to our session eyes. It's uh, open, unavailable. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, unlimited that you can uh, send us your sessions. So it's sessionize.com slash FISIC. Um, we also like to make the session of tonight as interactive as possible. Um, we have the Q&A window. So in the window that you're now in, um, on the right, you should see a Q&A window. There's also a chat window. Um, we prefer that you put the questions in the Q&A, but we can also move them from the one to the other. So um, please uh, let us know your questions as soon as possible, and we'll get to them maybe by the end. Or uh, if Peter wants to, he can also see the sessions during uh, see the questions during the session, and he can follow up on them as uh, as he wishes. So with that, uh, of course, we'd like to thank, of course, our partners again who make uh, our events possible. And with that, uh, I'd like to clear the stage. And I'd like to give the word to Peter, who is going to be talking to us about non-nullable reference types. Pini, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Jim. I'm going to share my screen. Not seeing it yet. Yep, yeah, now it's coming through. Yep. Yeah. OK, here we go. So good evening, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to thank Bizik for having me here tonight. Uh, it is quite uh, exciting for me because uh, it's uh, my first talk in a long time, more than a year, due to the, the pandemic, of course, with less um, yeah, events uh, or in-person events. And uh, last year in July, I became a father. So uh, it speaks uh, for itself that I didn't have much uh, time to spare to work on talks. Uh, but yeah, when Jill uh, asks something, he doesn't take no for an answer. So uh, I had to clear my uh, agenda a bit and uh, do some puzzling. And so here today, I'm giving this uh, presentation. So pretty exciting, pretty nervous as well, because it's my very first uh, online uh, virtual uh, session uh, as a speaker. So uh, I hope everything uh, goes well. My name is Pieter Nijs. I work as a senior .NET consultant and mobile expert at Experit Belgium. I'm a Microsoft MVP in Windows development, board member of the Madden user group. Uh, we organize uh, meetups uh, more around uh, uh, things like uh, the, the new things like Maui now and uh, HoloLens and WinUI 3 coming up, Project Reunion. You can find me uh, blogging at blog.pythoninjas.be and my Twitter handle is at Nespeter. So this talk today is going to be about uh, non-nullable reference types or nullable reference types. So the two terms are being used. Uh, it is a relatively new feature. It was introduced in C-sharp 8. Um, I started using it myself only like uh, a year ago when uh, a colleague and I, when we started a new Greenfield project, we wanted to try this feature out. And yes, it was uh, hair pulling and frustrating at times, um, but uh, eventually I was convinced about the positive uh, impact that it had uh, on our code. But I do think that it is still uh, a little known feature, maybe uh, the developer have, have cold feet, I don't know, or uh, it, it might be yeah, that they 
aren't really sure about uh, the impact uh, of it. And so that's why uh, I'm going to give this talk uh, today, just yeah, some introduction and give you some insights uh, about uh, or, or share you my experience uh, using this feature. The idea is that uh, you'll get the notion of nullable and non-nullable reference types. Uh, they'll allow you uh, to clearly state your intent, so that it'll be clear for another developer if he or she should expect a possible null value as a result, or if he is allowed to pass in null to a method. And with all of this uh, in place, your IDE will be your helping hand. The IDE will check if you aren't accessing possible null values prior to uh, a null check and uh, give you warnings if needed. Uh, it'll show uh, you where a given uh, variable may be null, where it is not null, which will greatly help you uh, with avoiding null reference exceptions. And that's, of course, uh, the ultimate goal, no more null ref reference exceptions. So then uh, we are in a utopian wonderland. And my apologies for this overly colorful uh, slide, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll uh, compensate it because the rest of the deck is just in black and white, but I wanted to do something utopian, fairy tale like, so there it is. Now, one more thing before we really, really start. Uh, I have prepared a lot of content. Uh, in fact, uh, when I did my first dry run, it was more than two hours. So I had to drastically cut uh, on slides and a little bit on uh, demos. Uh, but still, I couldn't quite fit it in, into the uh, time window uh, that I got uh, for the session. So I actually split it up in two parts. And uh, the first part will be uh, intro and basic. Uh, and it'll uh, take uh, 75 minutes, uh, give or take. And by the end of that, you should have some understanding of what uh, this feature is, how it can help you, how you can start using it, uh, what the pitfalls are, uh, what my uh, opinion uh, about it uh, all is. And then uh, right uh, after that, I'm going to uh, give some more demos, a little bit more advanced stuff, uh, digging into uh, or showing you more uh, attributes, uh, showing you how it integrates with Entity Framework, for example, and uh, some special things uh, about generics. Uh, Jill already mentioned the uh, Q&A window. Please type your questions there. I will take a look at them at the end of the, of the session. I'm not going to uh, look at them uh, while I'm giving a presentation because uh, it's such a tight schedule. So, But I'll try to answer your questions uh, after uh, the talk. So let's get started. What is the problem? Well, in .NET, we have value types. And value types, we know them, they always have a value. You don't need to check for nulls. You cannot assign null to them. You can just use their value. And if we're going to, if we take a look at the intent, well, the intent of a value type is clear. These variables should always have a value. As a parameter, the intent of the developer who created the method is that we expect a value and that we should pass a value. Or as a property or return type, the intent is um, that there is always a value to expect. We also got nullable value types. And nullable value types, they can be null. They, they, they are optional. You can access their value uh, by going to the uh, value property, you can check if they have a value with the has value property or do uh, a regular null check on them. And there the intent is that there can or cannot be a value. If a parameter is a nullable value, the intent of the developer who created the method was that you can optionally pass a value there. If you don't have anything reasonable to pass, just pass a null and the developer who created the method will take care of that because he clearly states that or clearly stated that the parameter can be null. If a property or return value is a nullable uh, value type, 
there might or might not be a value. So it is optional. And we as developers know that when it's a nullable value type, that we should do a null check prior to accessing uh, the value. So I'd say that nullable value types are awesome because as a developer, you can define them as non-nullable, uh, by which you mean that they are mandatory and that they will always hold a value. Or you can define them as nullable, which means that they have uh, an optional value, they can or cannot hold a value. And also by using uh, nullable value types, you are not forcing uh, developers to pass in dummy values like string.empty because you just don't know what else to pass, uh, for example. So, Wrong example because string is a reference type, but I mean uh, int dot max value, for example. Um, so if you don't have anything reasonable uh, to pass, just pass and no. The thing is that the intent is clear. The intent is plain as day. Uh, we know as a developer what to expect. We know as a developer what to pass in. Um, it is all clear. On the other side of the spectrum, we have reference types. And reference types, they can always be null. And on top of that, they are implicitly nullable in contrast to value types. So that means that, yeah, they, they can be yeah, uh, null, they cannot be null, we don't know. And the only way to um, check the null value is actually at runtime. So we can prevent a developer from passing in a null to a method by doing a null check in this method and throw a argument null exception when a null was passed. But that is at runtime and that might be too little too late. And yes, there might be some static code uh, analyzers that uh, can warn you for, for such uh, scenarios, but still, if the framework doesn't fully embrace it, if the framework doesn't fully uh, uh, expose uh, stuff that, that helps us uh, with that, yeah, I don't think we we're ever gonna get there. And on the other hand, I also wonder if developers really care about nullability from the get-go. I have the impression that if I see uh, a null check somewhere in code, when, when I do a code review, for example, Nine out of 10, this null check uh, was added because the developer faced a null reference exception. So he has written code, he tested it, and he said, oh, this can be null. So yeah, I'm gonna do a null check here. But nullability wasn't uh, there or wasn't thought of from the, uh, from the get-go. And I actually can't blame the developers for that because the framework doesn't force us to uh, think about it because there isn't anything in place. And that's why I think that reference types are jerks, because as a developer, you cannot define them as non-nullable. You cannot define them as nullable. There is no way to tell other developers your intent. If you have a method, uh, print person, for example, which accepts a uh, person parameter, if I want to call this method, I there's no way that I can see if I am allowed to pass null here. So maybe uh, the method will throw a, a null reference exception or an argument not null uh, exception if I pass in a null, or maybe the method uh, handles it pretty well and just prints out null. But we can't know, the intent is not clear. We can't know uh, how the um, method was designed. And yes, developers might uh, state uh, these kind of things in um, the comments of, of, of uh, their methods and of their code, but we all know that this also is often an, an afterthought uh, to comment our code. So we need to find a solution. And C Sharp 8 has a solution. So we want to work with reference types just the same way like uh, as we work with value types. We want to define if they are null, possibly null or not. How do we want to do this? Well, just like uh, this would be ideal, of course, if we uh, could define a nullable reference type 
as um, by adding a uh, question mark uh, postfix to it. And a nullable uh, reference type, we would just define it uh, without any, any special uh, postfix or anything. So this would make me a happy panda. Uh, this is really uh, in sync with how value types work and I would definitely want uh, it to work like this. But hold up, we've got a little problem here. So if we would say that this is a notation for non-nullable reference types, well, then that is a breaking language change. Because up to now, or up to C sharp, uh, prior to C sharp 8, if we would just um, say string, well, that is actually a nullable string. It can be null. So now we are, are with this, we are breaking uh, the language, we are changing the, 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 the defaults of the language. And that actually yeah, makes me a sad pen because how, how are we going to fix this? Well, the solution is that um, the usage of nullable and non-nullable reference types is opt-in, opt-out. And maybe that is also the reason why I have the impression that not a lot of devs uh, are using uh, this feature. How can we uh, opt in uh, on this? Well, on a project level in our CS proj, we can uh, state nullable enable, which enables the nullable annotations context. I'll explain you in just a second what that means. Or you can also just enable the nullable warnings uh, context. You can also use directives. So uh, in your classes, uh, for the entire class, or just for a few lines in your, your classes, you can use directives to enable or disable uh, nullable annotations or, or nullable anno uh, warnings uh, annotations. Um, and you can also mix and match these two. So on a project level, you can enable it and in a particular class, uh, disable the warnings, for example. And we will be doing that uh, in the demos as well to show you how that works. Now about these two um, nullable contexts that I, uh, talked about, well, we, we've got two contexts. We've got the noble annotations context. Uh, when we enable this, then we are using this new C Sharp 8 uh, yeah, feature or this new C Sharp 8 implementation. That means that every reference type that we uh, define is non nullable by default. And you can start using uh, the question mark uh, to indicate that it is nullable. And you can start uh, using the, the, the unary pose fix uh, or the uh, yeah, exclamation mark uh, as a no forgiving operator or as um, a for, for uh, forcing uh, a particular value. Uh, together with that, you also get a static code analysis. It's the same uh, code analysis that you would get uh, when you only enable the warnings uh, context. But on top of that, you, only, you also get hints in your uh, IDE about whether a particular uh, variable is null at a particular place or not. You can also opt for, uh, to only enable the uh, nullable warnings context. So this warnings context is, uh, well, you don't need to enable the annotation context for that. So this is something that is uh, uh, that can work without it. If you enable that, uh, what you're actually enabling is extra static uh, code analysis. And uh, this will give you warnings when you're trying to access a possible uh, null value. And this uh, nullable warnings context is something that actually you can already enable today in your uh, existing projects because this won't change the behavior of your code or anything. This will just generate extra warnings uh, in cases where you are possibly doing a, a, a access of uh, a possible null value. Um, that is, of course, if you are not treating warnings as errors uh, or anything. Um, but this will not break um, your existing code. And if you enable this, so uh, the warnings only, 
I guarantee that you will already, if you browse through these warnings, that you will already come across situations where you think, oh my God, this is, this is broken code. I need to fix this. Uh, luckily, it has never crashed before, uh, but it is possible that uh, this might be null and I haven't uh, done a null check here, so let me fix this. So I think this already uh, adds uh, or can give you extra value uh, in the short term. So the best way to learn this, and um, that's how uh, I started learning it last year, is uh, in a Greenfield project, file new project, uh, enabled the nullable annotations, context, and I checked uh, the checkbox treat warnings as errors, because warnings are easy to overlook, and yeah, they're just warnings, right? But if they are treated as errors, yeah, then you are forced to find a solution, you are forced to find a workaround, you're forced to, to fix it, uh, to do it the proper way in order to, uh, to build your code. It's of course possible that uh, in your situation, you might find this too uh, invasive. And you can also opt to add a custom code analysis uh, rule set, which will treat um, these null related warnings as errors. So then you can also, um, yeah, then you are also obliged to fix these errors upon building or if you want to build your code. Um, in the end, uh, I also, I'll uh, share a link to uh, such a, a code analysis rule set file where I have uh, configured that all these uh, notable related warnings uh, will be treated as errors. So, and without further ado, uh, I think uh, we can dive into our demos. Let me see. Um, let's open Visual Studio. And I'm gonna show you this little program. So this program, it uh, compiles, it runs, uh, there are some issues with it, but yeah, just by looking at the code, we are not aware about possible uh, issues. Peter, if, Peter sorry to interrupt you. Maybe it's better to make the font a little bit bigger. Yes, I will do that. Good call. Uh, is this better? Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, um, what can we do? So this is an existing uh, project. It's very exciting. It's a typical kind of uh, applications I write uh, every day. Um, what I can do in my CS project, I'm going to enable the notable warnings context. So when I look again at my program, I immediately see that Visual Studio will warn me about some stuff. So now I am, I didn't check the flag to treat warnings as errors. Um, there are some demos where they are treated uh, as errors, but in this case uh, it isn't, but yeah, these are really warnings. And what Visual Studio says is, it says, well, you are accessing first name on this customer, but you have never actually checked if customer is null or not. So we can easily fix this. If customer is not null, this is by the way, some new C sharp nine syntax is not null. I kind of like it. And you see, once we have added this check, this first warning already goes away. So we're safe on that one. Now our customer uh, object has a nullable uh, daytime property, VIP since, and we also get a warning on that because we don't check its value uh, or we don't check if it's null prior to accessing uh, the value. So we can also add uh, a check here. If it has a value, then we can continue. So compiler is happy. We have uh, just by enabling some uh, 
uh, or enabling these, these warnings, we are already fixing uh, bugs or potential uh, uh, bugs uh, in our code. Okay, but as I've said, we only enabled warnings uh, for now. So this still doesn't allow me to do something like this because the um, compiler isn't aware of what I mean. It gives me a warning that this only works if nullable annotations is enabled. So this means that right now, although these warnings are enabled, um, I'm still using reference types like I used them before. They can be null or they can uh, be null. We don't know. If I want to really use my nullable annotations, then I can enable them. And now you will see that I'm getting some other warnings in Visual Studio. So this one and also the next one, it's pretty obvious. It says you're trying to assign null to the customer variable, but you have to find the customer variable as non-nullable. Remember that when we are in the nullable annotations context, that reference types are uh, non-nullable by default. So I have to explicitly make this variable nullable um, so that I can assign null to it. And when we look um, in my, uh, when we look at my repository, very advanced uh, repository, there's also a warning here. Why? Well, if ID is zero, then I'm going to return null. But this isn't actually allowed because the signature of my method states that the return uh, value of my uh, method is a non-nullable customer, non-nullable by default. So I have to make it explicitly nullable in order to uh, yeah, make it work as intended. So now the compiler is happy here in my program.cs. If we take a look at the customer class itself, well, we see you see that we got some uh, warnings here about the properties, but let's ignore them for now. So what I can do is I can disable warnings so nullable disable warnings here and then after this property i can do nullable restore so they will take again um, the setting that was set prior to the to the disable i'm only disabling the warnings here so that means that actually i am still in a nullable context so i can uh, explicitly say that the first name is nullable so that um, nullable annotation context is still here, but I'm actually saying to the compiler, please don't give me any warnings. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Okay. And also this uh, to string method, we can uh, easily uh, fix uh, the warnings here. It was a little typo I had here, not that important, but okay. So I can define, for example, a post fix which is null by default. If VIP since has value, then post fix is this, for example. And then here I can return this together with the post fix. So, now, everybody is happy. This will work. If I had enabled uh, treat warnings as errors, I wouldn't have any errors. I would be able to run uh, my application. Everything would just work. Okay, let's take a look again here uh, at my uh, program.cs. I'm going to add a new method. Uh, void print customer. And I'm expecting a customer. And I'm going to copy all my code here to here. And now I want to call this method here, passing in the customer that I have here. I'm getting a warning. It's obvious why I'm getting this warning. Because my customer here at this location 
is nullable, but I have defined my method um, and I, uh, I said that the parameter customer is not nullable. So in order to fix this, I can add this check and then everything will be fine. So compiler is happy again. I could also do this, leave the checkout. So now um, the compiler doesn't complain. And here I could say uh, console.write line, no. So this is exactly what I mentioned earlier. With this nullable annotation context enabled, the intent becomes clear. I have defined a print customer method, and I clearly state that it is possible to pass in a nullable customer. So I know that I don't need to do a null check here. The method will handle it for me. Um, the title here, not that important. Um, what we can also do is we're gonna add an extra property, middle name. And middle name is optional, so it's nullable. So I add a mark here. And if I want to uh, do something with it, console write line customer middle name to upper for or to lower, for example. Ah, I'm getting a warning again. Why? Well, middle name is um, nullable, and I don't do any checks prior to it. So I can, again, do this check here. So if, oh, not customer, but customer of middle name. If customer of middle name is not null, then you're going to print the middle name. And so again, compiler is happy. Without the check, the compiler would not be happy. Now, let's try something else. If I would have a helper method, which would check if the customer has a middle name or not. So, Let's return customer that middle name is not null. So this is basically the same check. If I would call this method here, customer, ah, I'm getting a warning again. Oh, that's that's unfortunate. But it's yeah, the analyzer isn't smart enough to to understand what we are doing here. It doesn't know this. But we, as smart developers that we are. We know that in this method, we check if middle name is not null. So we know for sure that here on this line of code, that middle name will not be null. So what we can do is we can add the unary postfix. Uh, this, or it's also called the null forgiving operator. And yeah, the, the name says it all. It uh, forgives us or it force us, forces us um that we say to the compiler hey if you have any warnings uh if you have any remarks about this just keep it to yourself we are not uh interested uh, in your warnings we know what we are doing so don't give me any warnings uh, about that so this is how you can use the uh, null forgiving operator so that is that. Do I have anything else to say about this example? Uh, look. No. So let's move on to the next thing. So we disabled these warnings here. Now we want to do this properly. And let's fix these warnings as well. So what is the issue here? Well. Customer has currently an implicit default constructor. So I can new up a constructor without providing a first name and or a last name. But I have defined that in this uh, class, in this object, that first name and last name are mandatory, that they cannot be null. So this, this doesn't work. 
um, it really says that um, first name must contain a non value when exiting constructor. So let's do just that. String first name, string last name, and assign these values. And the cool thing is, once I add an uh, explicit constructor, that the the warning moves from the, the, the properties to the constructor itself. I think that it's pretty neat. Uh, first name is first name, last name is last name. So, and now the compiler is happy. And this is one of the things when I started using uh, the nullable annotation context, it was a bit like a, how should I say it, a, a aha moment. It, it really made me think about the fact that, yeah, we have constructors and maybe I personally have been using constructors not that much over the last years. Why not? Yeah, we got this object initializers, which are uh, a lot easier and, and, and a lot more fun to use. But if you think about it, there's only one way that me as a, as a developer when i create this customer uh class and, and i thought about the fact that okay first name cannot be null last name cannot be null middle name can be null the only way i can force another developer to correctly use my customer class is by providing a relevant constructor and the, the only the only term i can come up with is that for me using a uh, notable annotation context was also a, a constructor renaissance to me. Uh, so since I have been using notable annotation context, I have been thinking carefully also about uh, constructors and, 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 and uh, chaining constructors and stuff like that, because it is in fact the only way that I as a developer can guarantee that another developer uses my uh, class just the way that I have intended it and gives it the uh, right uh, values for all the uh, mandatory properties. And so this is what I think some, some nice extra benefit on top of just the noble annotation context and the fact that personally I uh, started thinking more and more about constructors. Now I know when I come across um, an instance of a customer, now I know that this object is, is valid. So everything that needs to be there is there. This is something that you cannot guarantee if you are uh, using object initializer, for example. So I think that we can um, move to another demo. And for that, I'm going to use some Git magic. Reload. Don't save. Okay. I have a, a an API, and I have created this API without a. Uh, or without the notable annotation context. And this API has a post method. I can uh, send a, a weather forecast search DTO uh, to it, and then I can do all my fancy, fancy stuff. I have created my uh, DTO, and I have declared uh, city to be a required property. Let's run this for a minute. So if I run this, it'll work. Of course, it, it'll work. But I have defined the city property to be uh, required. So if I don't pass the city property, or if I give it another name, the JSON, I am getting an error from ASP.NET saying that the city field is required. This is exactly why this required attribute is for. So ASP.NET will do uh, a validation of my DTO, and if it's not valid due to I've defined it 
and, and it needs to have a city property. If it doesn't have a city uh, property, it will you know, or it will uh, give me an uh, an error. So what does this mean if we uh, enable the nullable annotation context? It's my controller. So. Okay, I'm getting a warning here. Let's ignore this uh, for just uh, a minute. Now, I have this DTO. It's running in nullable annotation context. So this means that city is non nullable. So in fact, you might think that I can remove this required property because it's actually saying the same thing. Uh, if, yeah. City. If I would city, if I want city to be optional, I would just do this. But I want it to be required, so I am uh, uh, saying that it is a non-nullable string, so I can remove required. Let's check if this is true. Try it out. And indeed, uh, the validation still works. I don't need to explicitly uh, use the required attribute in a nullable annotation context. ASP.NET knows that yeah, I have uh, defined this as a non-nullable property. It knows that this should not be null, and, it, and when it is null, it'll throw an exception. Now. To get rid of this warning, this is actually the exact same warning that I showed you earlier. We need, because city is um, a required property or it is non nullable, we need to pass in the value via a constructor, right? So we can do this. The question is will this work? Will this work? And the answer is it depends. In this use case, it'll work. So my DTO is uh, constructed correctly. I'll add a breakpoint here uh, so that you can uh, really see it. If I execute, you see the uh, constructor is hit. Uh, the parameter uh, city is uh, passed in it, so it works. But I said that it depends. This only works since .NET 5. If this is a .NET Core app, uh, version 3.1, this will not work. Because the system. Let me see. The uh, system.text.json uh, serializer expects a default constructor. Uh, to create the, uh, the DTO. So I cannot do this in uh, .NET Core 3.1 application. It does work in um, .NET 5. .NET 5 uh, system.txt JSON uh, classes have all been uh, replaced or, or updated, and there it works. But how can we? So this would be the uh, so we're not going to use a constructor here. Uh, in the um, case of DTOs, how would we get rid of this warning? Well, there are a few possibilities. What I could do is I could give it a default value being null, but null is not allowed because yeah, city is non nullable. But I can say to the compiler with the exclamation mark, yeah, don't uh, argue about this. I know what I am doing. And actually, in this context, this isn't a real problem. Because um, the uh, DTO will be initialized using the constructor. The properties will, be, will get their 
values and then ASP.NET uh, will do a validation and if city is still no, yeah, then it means that it wasn't provided in the JSON and we would still get um, the 400 saying that uh, city is required. So I don't see a real big issue uh, by using uh, this. Um, you could also do uh, default, actually the same thing because the default of uh, a reference type is no. So this also works. Uh, what wouldn't make any sense is this. You could also do this, but this doesn't make any sense because now if the JSON uh, string lacks uh, a city property, DTO will be valid for ASP.NET because yeah, empty is not null, so everybody uh, is happy. Another way of uh, dealing with this, and I also don't think it is it is really wrong per se. I think it, it's a valuable option. I could um, disable the nullable uh, warnings uh, for my DTOs. And that is uh, what I have done on uh, some projects is if I really have uh, DTOs, uh, that for all these uh, DTOs, if I have uh, them in a separate um, project, that I disable the nullable warnings for the, for the entire project. Because I also don't think this is really that big of an issue. Uh, let the, the serializer do its, its thing and uh, in the context here of ASP.NET, the validation will still let you know if uh, something is wrong. So that's uh, about uh, the thing about DTOs. Let me yet again do some git magic. Pom, 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 pom. But what about manual deserialization? So I updated my code a little bit. Uh, I've also added a uh, get endpoint. And in there, I'm going to do some manual uh, deserialization. And when a DTO is, uh, or when I have my DTO, I'm just going to uh, pass it into the existing uh, or the search search method that I had uh, previously and do the thing there. Uh, take a look at the, at the DTO. So city is still there. I uh, opted to use uh, default null forgiving, which I think is, is valid. And I have an optional country uh, property here as well. Now, if you look carefully at um, the JSON here, the JSON doesn't contain a city parameter. So what do you think will happen? Well, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's going to crash. The question is, where is it going to crash? Let's find out. So let's call the get method, try it out, execute. Whoa, so crashed. And for crying out loud, it's a null reference exception. The one thing we are trying to avoid with all this uh, nullable annotation uh, stuff is null reference exception. And we have this uh, exactly here, uh, although at first sight, don't think that there is much wrong. Well, yeah, the thing is that we are not passing in a city in um, our JSON. And we said that city can have a default value of no. And we said to the compiler, forgive us that we do this, just handle it. But as soon as I access the property city here and I wanted to do an to upper, city is no and this is very 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 unfortunate because even if i hover over city visual studio says the city is not null here so this really means that by deserializing i can have objects that actually don't comply with the the contract if you will that i uh, 
defined. So, and that's a bit of a of a pity, of course. And, and just to be clear, it, this is not only for um, in, in in a API context kind of thing. This is also the case uh, if I'm writing an application and I have some uh, cache uh, caching uh, that I do in a JSON format and I want to deserialize it. Uh, it it's the same thing. So don't, don't see this as only a problem in uh, in an API context. So how do we fix this? Well, the way I like to fix this is, I'm gonna copy some code, is when I do some manual deserialization. Oops, this is not the wrong spot. Uh, I'm going to manually manually uh, check if the DTO is valid or not. So what I do here is I check if the DTO is null or not, and I check if a uh, city has uh, a value or not. So that way I can, if it is valid, and I pass in my search DTO, so I can do this. And this will work perfectly well, but as you can see, we get a warning uh, from Visual Studio. It says, well, search DTO may be null here, but we know, because we are smart developers, we know that actually if we do this uh, is a valid check, that the DTO will not be null, because if DTO is null, is valid, is false, and so we will never end up in this branch of our code. So again, we could use the null forgiving uh, operator, but I try to avoid uh, that guy as much as possible because I think it can shoot you in the foot uh, at some point. There is a much better way of dealing with this. We can add an attribute here to the property not null when true you see that the warning immediately goes away what is happening here so i'm actually helping the compiler i i i, I am helping the compiler i'm saying i'll explain you what i'm doing here i say to the, i tell the compiler that if this method which returns a bool if it returns true, then, my dear compiler, you can be absolutely sure that the DTO, which was passed in, is not null. And the compiler understands this and uh, knows that in this context, if you are at this branch in your uh, code, that search DTO is not null. If I would add an else statement here, and do something search DTO. If I hover over the variable here in this branch, now the compiler knows. Well, I actually don't don't, don't know what it is. It may be null here because yeah, that is valid uh, returned false. Yeah, the uh, DTO can be null here. So I think that this is a good um, solution to this. Um, yeah. Uh, problem that deserialization uh, can actually construct objects that not comply with um, what you have defined. Uh, another interesting thing that I quickly want to show you is uh, if we would do this, get JSON, and this returns this, And then JSON, let's get, J oops, get JSON. So what we typically do is, if the string is not null or empty or white space, whatever, doesn't make any difference in this uh, scenario, then we want to execute our code. So the cool thing is that JSON here, is not null. How does the compiler know that JSON is not null here? 
Well, because of the exact same attribute that we used here, if I have 12 on is null or empty, you see that in a .NET framework, there is also uh, the usage of this attribute. So it'll help us if we do an is null or empty check on a string, we know that um, if it returns false, that the value that was provided is not null. The same thing for is null or white space. So I think this is uh, an interesting thing to point out that the .NET framework uses um, this attribute as well. So that is that. Um, what else can I show you? I think that this is more or less the um, important uh, part that I wanted uh, to show you for this first uh, section of my, my presentation. Maybe let's undo my changes. And check out another version of my code. Now it's time for some bad news. Oh. I've got a small program here. And to be clear, in the CS Proj, I have enabled nullable annotations context. I'm not seeing any warnings whatsoever. Nothing. No warnings, no errors, because I, I even think that treat warnings as errors is enabled. So I'm not seeing any errors. I don't see any warnings. Everything is perfect. This is this is our utopian place, right? But still, if you look at this code, there are three scenarios where I can still have a null reference exception. So these are some pitfalls that you need to be aware of. So for example, if I create a new array of strings, for example, well, at this point, this uh, values uh, string array will contain 10 null items. If I get a value from it uh, and I do a, a to upper, for example, well, the compiler assumes things that uh, this variable is not null here. It's just the way it is, because the array is defined as a non-nullable string, but still when it gets initialized, I'm getting all nulls there. So if I would run this, this will this would throw a null reference exception. Now this is also an interesting one. I need to point out, need to be honest, that person is a struct here. And if I initialize a uh, struct, uh, with the default, or I could just say um, new person, for example. So all the uh, reference type properties will get a null value. The compiler isn't aware of this, and it still thinks that here at this point in time, last name is not null. So it will throw also a null reference exception here when I do a to upper. And then this one, also very interesting. So this is uh, still the same uh, customer class that we had uh, earlier in, in, in the demos. So I can new up a customer uh, class here. I do a null check on middle name. So the compiler uh, thinks a hey, middle, middle name is not null here because of the null check. But I have this do something secret method, and in this do something secret method, I'm actually setting middle name to null. So yeah, the compiler doesn't see this and still thinks that here on line 38 that middle name is still not null. And yeah, it doesn't give me any warnings. So in fact, if I would run this code, I would get a null reference exception here as well. And then another thing to think about is if you are building libraries. So, for example, I have my nullable library here, and it uh, has the nullable annotation context 
enabled. I don't have any warnings. I don't have any errors here. Everything works like you expect it uh, to work. Um, got my, my person here, first name, last name, middle name, everything perfect. Uh, in my repository, uh, if I try to get an item by ID, I know that uh, it can be uh, null, so it's nullable when I want to save a person. Uh, I only uh, accept a non-nullable person because what else is there uh, to save? The same thing for uh, a particular check on, on, on the national number, if it is uh, unique or not. Uh, I only expect a non-nullable national number. Again, what else is there to check? So this is all fun and games, but yeah, if I run this or if I use this uh, from another project or, or within the same project, with this little bastard, I can just yeah break everything. So if I wouldn't have uh, this unary post fix here, then I would get a warning and it would say, yeah, you cannot uh, say that uh, you're expecting a person here. This needs to be nullable, but because that is how the, the method is, is defined. But yeah, if I think I know better, I can just add uh, the unary post fix and then no warnings, no warnings at all. The same thing for the is unique. I'm not allowed to pass a null here, but yeah, I can force a null here. And the same thing for the safe. I only allow non-nullable persons here. So it would give me uh, a warning, but I can add the exclamation mark and say, dear compiler, I know what I'm doing. I'm passing a null. And it actually gets worse. If the project that uses my library doesn't know about the nullable annotation context. So if you look here, there's nothing here. We are just using the um, uh, the code like we would prior to, to C sharp eight or, or without the, the, the nullable annotation context. I don't even have a clue. I don't even have a clue that uh, string here needs uh, to be non-nullable. The same thing for person. I can just pass a null like I would have uh, done um, without my uh, without the nullable annotations in the nullable library. So you can't force uh, colors of your code of your library to use the, the nullable annotation context. So I would argue that if you are using um, or if you are building a library that is uh, used in your um, uh, in your company, well, <laughs> in your company, um, and you don't control or, or it, it is used by by some legacy applications or or whatever, I think it might be safe to uh, do to still do null checks um, in your uh, nullable libraries, even though you define that person should not be null, um, I think it might be valuable to still um, do some null checks here and, and uh, throw exceptions uh, if needed. Also, if you have a um, library on Nougat, uh, for example, that, that uh, people use, you can't force all developers to uh, that use your library to to suddenly switch to the nullable annotation context. So if people don't enable the nullable annotation context, they are perfectly well allowed to pass in null. And in these cases, I think it might be valuable to still do some null checks. So we've seen these pitfalls uh, with the nullable annotation context. Uh, struct, uh, structs, we need to uh, watch out uh, for them. Arrays, uh, defects, like, like I said. Um, 
that you cannot force callers to use the noble annotation uh, context so they are so they are still able uh, to pass in nulls where you wouldn't expect them uh, developers can use um, the unary post fix so they can force null or they can force defaults if they want and yeah static uh, analysis can't see everything i remember the um, method where i assigned the the middle name property again to null this is something that can be um, seen by the by the analyzer uh, sadly so pitfalls we have already seen that uh, in a demo so to wrap up this uh, first section of um, of my presentation, um, if this is the first time that you you dived or, or looked at uh, non-nullable reference types, I can believe that it is a lot to digest. There's a lot to think about, a lot of new uh, things to learn, and it is, it is really working with a new set of, of rules um, all of a sudden. And still, it doesn't uh, avoid no reference exceptions uh, completely. So you might argue or you might ask the question, is it all worth it? Well, I would say yes. I think that no, non-knowable reference types are awesome. And yes, you still might need to do some uh, null checks uh, in, in public entry points, that is the scenario I said where, where you create a library that is used by other uh, people. Uh, you still need to do some uh, null checks after manual uh, deserialization uh, to check if if the object is indeed constructed as uh, you uh, want it to be. Uh, or you can, uh, like uh, I did with, with the DTOs, but I wouldn't use it in any other scenario, uh, but for uh, DTOs, you can select, uh, you can disable uh, warnings in these uh, situations. Because I, I do think um, that in this, when you're using the, the nullable annotation context, if it is enabled, it does help you with writing better code, more robust, more maintainable. Um, you are actually, for a lot of cases, moving runtime issues or potential runtime issues to build time issues, which is, which is of course, a lot better. And I think this is a really important one. The intent is much more clear. You can now imme immediately see, am I allowed to pass in, in no uh, to this method? What is the return uh, of this method? Is, is this nullable or not? Uh, so do, should I need to do a, a null check prior to um, uh, to accessing uh, properties of, of that object? So yeah, I think personally that uh, nullable reference types are uh, really great. So a call to action if you want to get started with it. Um, I think for green, new greenfield projects, file new projects, I would definitely encourage you to enable the nullable annotation context and check treat warnings as errors. I know it, it is playing uh, .NET or C Sharp on uh, hard mode, but it definitely pays off. Uh, or if you find that too invasive, you can add a rule set uh, that will only um, treat the no related warnings as errors, if you will. I'll share a link to that uh, in the next slide. And for existing projects, I think it can be very uh, valuable to uh, enable the, the notable warnings uh, context. It doesn't impact your code, doesn't change the behavior of your, your code. You will just get more warnings, and I think you will already uh, come across some things that you uh, had overseen, uh, no checks that, that, that you forgot, uh, so you can uh, gradually start uh, adding those. I don't have any experience with an existing uh, project and converting it to uh, a project with the, the nullable annotation context enabled. I don't have any experience um, with that. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, 
uh, I think the best approach would be to uh, do it, yeah, file per file uh, with uh, um, your uh, uh, directives, uh, enable it uh, file per file and, and then fix it uh, file per file, but I haven't any uh, experience uh, with that. Need to find a customer who wants to do this because I think it is very interesting to do. So for uh, further uh, resources, uh, I talked to you about this rule set uh, that will uh, treat uh, null related warnings as errors. It will definitely help you uh, with learning uh, to work with this uh, notable annotation context. Uh, you can find it on, on the link on the slide. The demos, uh, I've already put a link up here, but if you browse to it, you'll find an empty repo. Uh, I didn't find uh, the time yet to uh, upload my demos as said. Uh, uh, we have a little baby here, so the evenings can be a little bit chaotic. So uh, I hope that tomorrow or uh, this weekend uh, at the latest, I upload my uh, demos uh, to there so that you can take a look uh, at them and see the, the things that uh, we have built. And then, yeah, uh, the idea is that I uh, move uh, further on with some, some demos. So the things that, that you have seen were the basics. Uh, it should give you a good understanding or more or less uh, an idea of uh, how to use the nullable reference types, what their added value is, uh, which things to uh, watch out for. The next thing that I'm going to show you might be a little bit more advanced and might be things that, that you will not immediately uh, need, but uh, I uh, definitely wanted uh, to show you uh, them. Uh, maybe, um, Gilles, are there any questions in, in the Q&A? It's uh, currently one question. Uh, yes. Sure, you should be able to see it. Actually, it's quite a long question, so it might be easier. Okay. To but otherwise, it's it's it might be a. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you click on Q and A, yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, Um, okay, so um, if I understand correctly, so um, these uh, projects are, are these in, 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 no, let me, let me rephrase that. I don't think that, if I understand correctly, that uh, a lot of value uh, is lost. If you enable this uh, nullable reference, um, annotations, um, uh, notable annotations uh, per project, it will definitely work. So if I have a, and I, I can show you that, um, if you're in this example, so this library has nullable enabled, but the library that, that was calling, or the application that was calling into the library didn't have nullable enabled, that was, the root cause of the issues. But if I add it here as well, then you will see that I will get um, these warnings. So if all of your projects use uh, the nullable uh, enable, so it's with a nullable annotation uh, mm -hmm. context, then it's, it's, it's just uh, safe uh, to use. You don't need to worry about losing any value. Uh, everything will, will work. Does that uh, answer your question? Let's hope it answers that's, that's Mario's perfect. question. <laughs> Let's hope it was answered. So far, no other questions. So, um, OK. So I think we can continue. Yes. I'd love to continue with um, some more demos. Okay, just first, uh, more advanced stuff. Yep. Just going to load everything. 
correctly. And it's it. This. Yes. So reload. OK. So um, oh, this is actually the, the wrong thing because I'm, I'm going just to, to, to speed everything a little bit up. I am um, going to show the results immediately. And I'll guide you all through. So, um, so this is the project uh, that we used uh, earlier. So the, the API with, uh, with the DTOs. Um, one of the things that I changed is I've added another optional parameter country code. And uh, the idea is that one of these two needs to, to be filled in to be a um, uh, valid uh, DTO object. So um, what can we do with that? So what I want to do is if, um, the, um, if the country in my DTO is null, so the object is valid. So I know that I have a country or a country code in my DTO. If the country code is not null, while the country is null, then I want to search the country in my database um, or yeah, in, in, in a local file um, using the given country code. Just ignore the normalized code for now. That's, that's for another uh, example. What this method does, and this is also interesting, this um, uses the same attribute that I used for the is valid. Remember with the is valid, I uh, said to the compiler, if this method returns true, it's guaranteed that this DTO is not null. And in this, for this method, I uh, also use a try get uh, paradigm. I'm passing in a country code and I add this attribute to an output parameter. So I basically say, if this method returns true, I guarantee that this output parameter is not null. So then again, the compiler can understand uh, our flow and it knows in this uh, fork of our code that country is not null. So, it, so here we returned true. We added an attribute that country is not null when it is returned true, the compiler understands this. And so here we can perfectly uh, use country in a safe manner. In the else, of course, we get uh, the remark that country may be null uh, at this uh, place. So I also think this is a very interesting uh, attribute to use in combination with an output parameter. Um, another thing I would like to show you is, uh, so let's take a look at the normalized code. So what does this normalized co country code do? It accepts the country code or a code, and it does a, a two upper. Now you see that I, uh, accept a nullable string here and also the return type is also nullable. What I can say with this attribute is that it is not null, so the, what I return, the string, is not null if the code parameter is also not null. Why is this interesting? Well, in this case, I checked country code prior to calling the normalized uh, country code method. So in here, I know that search DTO country code is not null. And so with the usage of this attribute, return not null if not null, the compiler also knows at this point that normalized code is also not null 
because I clearly stated that uh, if the proper or if the parameter that I passed into the method is not null, I guarantee that what I return is also not null. So I also think this is a uh, interesting uh, attribute that you might need uh, in particular situations. I also want to quickly uh, move move back here to the try and get country uh, for code. I also want to point out that um, the um, compiler also helps us with with the things that we um, say that we are doing. So we say that if we return true, that country is not null. Imagine I made a typo here and I do equals no. Then the compiler says, oh, this is not true what you're saying here. You are saying that if you return true, that country is not null. But in fact, as the code uh, is stipulated here, uh, this is not correct uh, what you're doing here. So if you're writing these uh, kinds of, of, of methods, uh, when you're using these kinds of attributes, the compiler also helps you checking that what your intent is that you're really doing that. So I think this was also important to, to note. And then the next thing that I would like to show you here is that um, I'm going to move it further down to make it more clear. So what I do here in, in my code is I'm trying to get a country. I'm gonna see if it is in a DTO. If it is, if it's not in a DTO, I'm gonna see if I have a country code. Um, and uh, if I uh, have a country code, I'm gonna try to search for the country. So there are some cases here, uh, some else's that that I left out, in which country can still um, be null, where a country still doesn't have a value. And you can see this if I um, type country here, that, um, let's see, normally it should say country is not null here. Why does it think that country, country should be null here? <laughs> so is the compiler confused? I don't know. Uh, country, what is country? Ah, okay, so now it understands. So it says here at this point in time that country may be null here. We, we didn't find a country in, in all of these or in all of these situations. What I've built here is a helper method to throw an exception. So I see this in, in some projects that uh, people like to have some helper classes uh, so that they throw uh, exceptions in a, a uniform uh, way. Well, we can add um, some hints to the compiler that the only purpose for this method is to throw an exception if a particular uh, situation is met. So if you look here at throw when country null method, I pass in a um, parameter has no country. So in that case, has no country, I need to throw an exception. I can, uh, of course, uh, add some, some other uh, properties here as well, because now in this situation, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but I think you get the point. Then with this attribute, I can inform the compiler that this method does not return if this is true. So what do I mean with does not return? Well, it throws an exception. This is also something that um, might be uh, helpful if you're building an, an assertion library or something like that. So uh, in some situations, yeah, a method does not return, it throws an exception. And I use this here just to show that um, the compiler understands that if country is null, so that is my, uh, my, my Boolean parameter here, if country is null, 
that this method doesn't return. In other words, it throws an exception. That means from this line and lower, that country is not known because it only comes here if this method returns and it doesn't return if country is known. So this is also an interesting uh, thing you can use uh, for uh, in particular situation. To be honest, I haven't used this uh, myself uh, in any project or so, but uh, I uh, thought it was useful to, to show you that it is uh, possible to hint the compiler about the flow that you are uh, willing to do. Um, let me see another thing that I would like to show you. Just a second, bear with me. Come on. Um, we also updated my weather forecast uh, class. I've added a request ID, which is a property. It is required, it is non nullable. And this is a value that is set in my constructor. So I, I, I new up a weather forecast object, and with the parameters that I use to new up my uh, weather forecast object, I do something to to create a request uh, ID. The idea is just that I wanted to have a, a constructor shared uh, code uh, method. So this is a method that is called from uh, from each or should be called from each constructor. So the warning that I'm getting here is that uh, we already know this warning is that the compiler says. When you exit the constructor, the request ID is not set. Well, that's not true, dear compiler, because we are in fact setting the request ID in this method, and this method is called from within each constructor. But yeah, the uh, analyzer can't see that. So we can so we can hint the um, compiler again with uh, an additional attribute, name of request ID in this case. And uh, with that, my, the, the warnings go away. What does this attribute uh, say? It says when exiting this uh, method, the request ID property will not be null anymore. And this is something that the analyzer can analyze. So it sees that this method is called from within each constructor. So it's happy. It is uh, assured that the request ID is not null when exiting the constructor. And again, if I wouldn't do anything with this in this method, it, it, it might be hard to see, but there is still this warning that now says, well, uh, you declared that this method assures that request ID will not be null, but actually you don't do anything in this method to assure that. So the compiler helps us uh, a lot with that um, intent. Now, and I only discovered this um, yesterday while doing uh, a dry run of my talk. Um, I discovered something interesting. Uh, which is also this member is not null, but there's also an is uh, member not null when. I didn't know about that uh, attribute, maybe I, I haven't needed it yet. But this is interesting for remember where we had this uh, method that uh, checked if a customer has a middle name or not, and then we used. Uh, the null forgiving attribute uh, in order to make the compiler happy because we were sure that we checked this thing in this method. Well, I discovered that I'm gonna put this in comments. I discovered that if I would add a method here, public bool has middle name. Oops. Middle name 
It is not, no? I can use this uh, member not know when. So I can say if I return true to this method, then the uh, middle name property is not null anymore. So if I update my code here and say customer dot has middle name, then I can even remove this uh, null forgiving operator because now the compiler knows that middle name is not null thanks to this member not null when attribute. So very interesting to use uh, as well. It might even, and this, I'm not lying, this is untested code. If I um does this also work on properties i'm not sure but let's try it out huh, it even works on properties so this is this is actually pretty cool and and it's new to me uh, as well so uh yeah this is cool uh let's see if it works as we would expect it to work yeah it works as we expect it to work so this is actually pretty pretty cool okay let's load yet again another version of my code Oh yeah, I think that I, I forgot to, to add some, uh, or to tell you about some, some other stuff. Uh, let's first take a look at generics. Generics are, are, are a little bit of a pain in the ass. Um, so I have um, some methods that uh, use generics. Um, there are a bit. There, there are some some issues uh, with that. So we do get uh, a new uh, constraint that we can use. So uh, we can define um, that the the type that we uh, pass in uh, should not be null. Should not be nullable. So this is for the find to method, and I have here an array of nullable strings. So if I use find to here. This will not be allowed because the uh, type uh, parameter t is defined as not null. So, so far so good. Nothing, nothing really special here. But there is some, or there are some problems with with this code. Um, the first thing is that um, if you look at the find method, what does it return? It, 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 it returns our type argument. In this case, for example, what is our type argument? String. So this means that the method returns a yeah, non-nullable string in this case. But if you look carefully at the code, I call array first or default. So it is, I, I uh, potentially return a null value here if there isn't a match. We can't do this, sadly. Um, I'll explain you, try to explain you why in just a second. If we want to uh, identify that, and you can, by the way, also see that here after I call this find method, that the result that the compiler thinks that result is not null here, yeah, that's a lie, of course, because it's possible that we don't find a match. And so uh, result can perfectly well be null here. Um, in order to hint a compiler about this thing, um, we can add an additional attribute saying that what we return may be null. Now you see that we get a warning about the fact that result is possibly null and that we need to check this. Can I? Do it like that if you want. So 
So as I've said, it is not possible to do this. Why? Well, the thing is, and that is, uh, it is something, I think, uh, is it, was it a bug? Maybe, I don't know. Um, in .NET 5, this is fixed. So, but this is uh, .NET Core uh, 3.1 that I'm using here, just to um, point it out. Um, you need to be, if, if you want to do this, you need to be explicit uh, about the fact if uh, T can be a struct or a class. So if I do this, oops, if I do this, then this is allowed and this works as we uh, would expect it. Now, of course, if I now have an array with integers, I can't use a find method on this uh, array of integers because my, my type uh, argument uh, would not be okay. So for that, I would need to add a second and really I even need to change the name because the signature uh, would be the same. Um, find a uh, struct, for example. So this can only work if I add a struct here. So that way I can also use this for uh, structs. It's a bit sad, but it's something that's only in, um, or that is fixed, uh, better yet, in .NET 5. So if I change this, you can see if I remove this, that now this is perfectly valid and that we can use it like that. So yeah, generics is is is, is a is a tricky one um, to look out for. Um, there can be um, some some issues with it, um, but I think a lot of um, the things you, you run into are fixed in uh, .NET five. And then the final thing I would like to show you. It's also what I think is is an interesting one because I, I'm not aware if, if a lot of people are aware of it. Oh no, just just first one one, one more other thing. Um, let me reload. Um, where is it? Um, let's go back to the customer. Uh, Thing that we, hmm. oh no, sorry, it's, it's, it's a long branch. Uh, yeah, reload. Okay. This is the one that, that I also want to show you. Um, or is it? Come on. Uh, it's here. Yeah, it's in the weather forecast again. Uh, I also have uh, a allow no attribute. Um, so this can be particularly uh, convenient if you have a property which returns, which always uh, returns a non-nullable reference type, but you are allowed, you are able to, uh, to assign null to it. So this can be, uh, or this might be uh, convenient in, in, in some uh, situations. Um, you can define it uh, like this. So uh, that if I assign null to summary, I do a check that if it's null, that uh, I return uh, an empty string. So you can do it like that. You can also um, do it like uh, this. This is also uh, valid to uh, handle this uh, situation. And this also needs to be handled. So that way you can also um, do um, this. And you also have a disallow null. This is for uh, properties that have a nullable reference type. Um, and, but you say, you explicitly say that you are not allowed to assign null to it. So, and I think if I look here at my controller, I have some little uh, snippet or something. Um, 
So this is my, my summary property. Uh, I, I assign a null value to it. Then I get a warning that it's not allowed to assign null to it, although this is a nullable uh, property, but with the attribute, I clearly stated that I don't want to allow this. But I also wanted to show you this little uh, example. Um, but then um, I think a very interesting one. Uh, I need to undo my changes first. What about Entity Framework? A lot of developers use Entity Framework, me included. How does this all relate to Entity Framework? Does it work together? Does it, do they play nice together? Well, let's take a look. So I have a little sample here. So I have got a customer and a customer has orders and a customer has a preferred language a customer has optional customer metadata customer has addresses an address has a country just a basic object graph uh, nothing really fancy uh, going on here so and i uh, created this uh, project without um, nullable annotations so that actually means that uh, we, we are we, we are used to creating uh, stuff like this, um, but it means that for entity framework uh, code first that if you want to explicitly state that a property is non-nullable, then you need to add the required attribute to it. If you don't add anything to it, then uh, it will be uh, treated as uh, yeah, nullable. So in the table that will be generated by Entity Framework uh, will uh, allow nulls uh, in this column. And you can see that I have uh, a migration here. Uh, if I look at customer, you see that first name is not nullable. Middle name, for example, is nullable. Now, if I would enable nullability or the, or the nullable annotation context for my entity framework um, entities, it can look like this. So you don't see any required attributes anymore. Why? Well, now we're in a nullable annotation context. Um, so this means that by default reference types aren't nullable so now uh, when creating um, a migration they know that okay this is a non-nullable uh, reference type so we are not uh, going to allow null in a database on the contrary for things like the middle name which was optional i have to explicitly uh, at the, the question mark here, so that Entity Framework knows that this is uh, optional in the database. Again, if we look at um, the migration for this, so this was then generated with uh, nullable annotations on, and then you can see the same result that first name is nullable false and middle name nullable true. So Entity Framework, perfectly well placed together with this nullable annotation context and actually works just like you would expect. What is also interesting, uh, my customer metadata uh, navigation property was optional because the foreign key was already defined as optional. So I can just add a question mark here to identify that this uh, also can be uh, null. I'm going to collapse language for now. It's a little surprise for the end. Uh, and then for things like this first name and this last name that need to have uh, a value uh, upon creation, you can use uh, constructor binding. So Entity Framework supports uh, constructor binding. So I can perfectly well do this. And so my things, I, so I won't get any warnings about first name and last name if I won't 
have this, you would see that yeah, that my um, that I get warnings errors in this case that uh, first name and last name are not set by the constructor. Um, okay, so so far so good. The only thing to that you need to do some some special things is um, a navigation property. So a non nullable navigation property. This is is a bit special. Uh, in order to make this work, um, I most of the times use this approach. So I can't a navigation property. You can't use a constructor binding for that. So I'm not allowed to uh, do this and assign uh, preferred language uh, to the value that is passed in. This would not work in Entity Framework. So I have to come up with something else. So the idea is that I'm giving my preferred language, so, which is uh, mandatory. I give it a nullable backing field. When I set the value, I just assign that value to the backing field. But when I get the value, I return uh, the value of the backing field. But if it's null, I'm going to throw an invalid operation exception. Now you might say, why is that? Peter, um, you are doing too much work. You can actually simply do this, don't you? Well, yes, this also works. But I think, uh, in my opinion, that, um, how should I say it? This is not, I prefer, I'll show you why. But I prefer my uh, my other approach. But let me show you what this does. So if you say, yeah, Peter, this is too verbose, you don't need to do that. Just give it a default null value, use the force uh, operator, and, and done with it. OK, good. Let's try that out. Let me also tell you that I am using eager loading. So if, for example, I want to get my customers and I don't specify it, I want to eager load my preferred language, then I would get this. Oops. Ah. <laughs> because I treat all warnings as errors, I guess. So if I uh, do this, oh, what do I get? I get a no reference exception. Well. That's odd, and, and that's quite counterintuitive because yeah, preferred language is defined as non-nullable. Why do I get a null reference exception? Yeah, the clue is that you didn't include it uh, to be eagerly loaded. So, and that's why I think if you use this approach, you get another type of exception. So, instead of a null reference exception. So now if I run this, I get an invalid operation exception, stating that uh, an initialized non-nullable property preferred language. I think this is, for a developer, a lot more clear that he actually forgot to include um, the property to be eagerly loaded. So in fact, both things work the same. You will get. Uh, an exception when, when when accessing the value uh, when the value is null when, when we didn't eagerly uh, load it, um, but I think this this makes more sense. Now the developer knows immediately, uh, especially if he is used to working in in, in this uh, kind of environment. Now he knows. Okay, this is because I forgot to add. Um, uh, the include to be uh, so that the property is being eagerly loaded, as opposed to that user might think, whoa, so preferred language, that there's something wrong with the data because it seems that, that it is null or, or, or it can be null. I think this, um, this is a better uh, approach of, uh, of doing that. So if I would include it and I would run uh, my code, then everything works just fine. 
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are done for today. So mm -hmm. I will uh, take a look at the at the Q and A. Uh, if there is anything, Jill. Yes, there's uh, one more question. Okay, I'll take a look. The example of built visualization. No, so that is um, um, so about the, the, the deserialization in uh, .NET 5. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, um, entirely based on some. Uh, it is convention based actually, so it needs to be. If I'm not mistaken, it needs to be the same type. It needs to be uh, the same name. Casing is ignored. Um, but uh, it will only uh, work uh, if you comply to these uh, to these rules. All the rest was clear, apparently. So, uh... or or everybody left. Oh, everybody left. <laughs> let's assume not. Let's assume not. All right. So, so uh, uh, I really want to uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, if you have any further questions. You can uh, reach out uh, on Twitter or you can uh, send me an email. My uh, contact details are on this uh, slide. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, I made you a bit uh, warm about uh, nullable reference types and non nullable reference types. Uh, I had uh, fun doing it, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. And I uh, will see you soon, so on uh, June 3rd, that is for the next week's session. Thank you.